since it's light outside, it's still afternoon here. Um, and we've now got the final session of this uh, conference. The uh, uh, highlight, which no denigration to the earlier speakers, um, since uh, the whole event is in honor of Christopher, um, it's his um, response and views. And so I'll say, my name is Peter Riddle, I direc I'm director of the Institute for Government. And when I saw the title um, of uh, Christopher's talk, Four Decades of Reform in Whitehall, did they create a government that works better and costs less? That's exactly the theme of what we spend our time doing here. And um, we produced, um, beginning of last week, an open letter to the new civil service leadership uh, and uh, Francis Maud on exactly those themes, on how you make government work better, which is going to cost less. Um, now we've got, in a sense, the, the back story um, of this, um, looking backwards for the research which Christopher's been doing, which is a culmination of a lot of, our, a lot of the other work he's, he's done over the decades. Um, into these themes, um, we're going to have, a, they call this, I think, in, in um, Hollywood, a sneak preview of the research um, um, before um, a, a paper is going to be produced uh, later this year and a book next year on these themes. And after Christopher's made his presentation, which um, we look, look forward to, then we're going to have um, one of the guilty men speaking. Um, <laughs> uh, because um, Richard Mottram, uh, Richard, you did say in this collection that you've been involved in these debates over three or four decades. So you can't escape um, uh, involvement and commitment on that. Um, and um, Richard will be offering his distinctive uh, and uh, original view on, on, on that. And then I hope we'll have time for some questions to be raised because we want to end this session about 6.45 and also just before Christopher wants to say some final words at the end. I'm delighted to have such a, a distinguished audience of um, both academics and also some, um, glad to see one or two current practitioners um, uh, as, as well as some past ones here. Uh, Christopher. Thank you very much. I decided I'd talk this evening about what happened uh, to central uh, administration and government over roughly my working lifetime to date, three to four decades. And I'm going to tell you about work that I've uh, been doing for the last 18 <coughs> months, along with my colleague uh, Ruth Dixon, uh, in a study that's funded by the League of Dean so the question that I'm putting before the court is, did four decades of reforms in UK central government create a government that works better and costs less, a phrase that some of you will recognize as having been taken from the Clinton-Gore National Performance Review of 1993? Um, the, the background is that the, the last four decades um, have contain many attempts to reform and, and reshape Whitehall um, in the name of, of uh, efficiency and better public services. Um, I'm commenting here, and I, this is not an original uh, phrase, it comes from Paul uh, Flynn in his great book, uh, Dragons Led by Poodles, uh, where he says the future is always the same, it's the past that keeps changing. Um, most of the evidence of the debate, of course, about government efficiency is conducted at a, a fairly e evidence-free level, but in organizations like this one, the Institute for Government, it's reasonable for us to look for evidence. Absolutely. So what and where is the evidence that government works best and costs less or not, as the case may be? Um, so let's start with work better. Um, what happened to public trust and respect in government and public services? What happened to levels of public satisfaction with the delivery of public services? What happened to the quality of <coughs> policy and legislation? You may think these questions are rhetorical, um, but I think you'll find, or we have found, that, that they're not. Let me start with, with public trust and, and respect. Um, we have in the room Christopher Pollitt, um, who along with his colleague um, Piers Utrecht, have produced a well-known um, book on uh, reforms across uh, a, a range of uh, uh, countries, uh, which <coughs> refers to uh, data about uh, trust in, in government. I can't do justice to the nuances of their arguments here. Um, if we ask a question of the US federal government, we find that there's data going back to the late 1950s which comes from 
a set of questions about whether you think the people who run government are honest, whether you think government is, is, is captured by special interests, whether you think government wastes money uh, due to the cutting of the Labour Press session and whether you think it makes good decisions and these get amalgamated into an index have been for all this time um, that uh, that produces uh, these numbers and what you see here is an up and down pattern with the numbers in the end at rather lower than at the outset there are all kinds of questions we could ask about the validity <coughs> of these data um, and we find the same problems with equivalent UK data we don't have an exact UK map for, for that data Something we have over approximately nearly 40 years um, is a set of questions <coughs> uh, asked about whether government is trusted to put the needs of nation over political uh, party. Um, quite an odd question, it's not sure exactly what it's measuring. It's quite a lot less sophisticated than most uh, US uh, trust uh, data, but it too uh, shows a drop over time although the drop comes quite a bit later than the US uh, index. In the U US, if you were looking at that last graph, the big drop comes in the 1960s and 1970s. In this uh, run from the UK, it's in the later 1980s and 1990s when it uh, falls after which it spikes up and down. Um, we can take later data for a later period from the uh, Euro uh, barometer sources where we're, we're looking at data for only part of this period this is 15 years rather than 30 years but it does enable us to see how people respond when they're asked about uh, trust in government without that sort of Trumpy-esque put country before party uh, formulation and it also enables us to compare the UK score with the uh, with the mean score for the other European countries uh, and this looks more like a story in which trust is unevenly falling um, and trust e and distrust is unevenly rising over time. That's consistent with the uh, last graph. And it's also notable that the UK levels of trust tend to be lower than the European uh, Union average and that <coughs> levels of distrust tend to be somewhat higher. There's not much difference from the don't know levels. Um, and that's borne out by a... Um, Eurobarometer survey uh, a few years ago on trust in official statistics, um, which was actually repeated uh, again two years after this data, producing the same uh, general results. So it can't, this, this can't just have been a transient response to some particular story about um, problems on the day that it was issued. And what we see here is that the UK was at the bottom of this V in terms of trust in official statistics, not by a long head admittedly, and probably well within the limits of making an error, but still in line with the observations that levels of trust in UK government are at the low end of the European scale. Um, a, a set of numbers that the civil service here like better um, are, are, are those that come from the uh, Ipsos Mori questions about trust in, in professions, which is run from the early 1980s, and that shows an increase in respondents expressing <laughs> trust in civil servants, what, whoever they think they are, um, to, to tell the truth. But we see the, the opposite pattern for politicians um, who, back in the early uh, 80s, seem to have been relatively close to civil servants on, uh, on this uh, survey, but have since sharply diverged. Um, if you look at the World uh, Values Survey data, as, as, as cited by uh, Christopher Hollis and here, uh, um, what we see is uh, much more of a flat picture. The, this is asking about confidence um, in the civil service, not government, civil service. So what these um, data seem to, to suggest, uh, just as, uh, as Christopher and Piet say, we can't say very much about what happened to trust and respect in government over this period, but such data as we do have um, suggests that we seem to see a different pattern for officials um, than that for politicians, and that trust 
uh, and continental officials is either flat or, or possibly uh, increasing, um, but that uh, trust in politicians and in government more generally looks, looks as if it's falling. Now let's turn to the second question I asked about satisfaction with public services. Um, there are, of course, lots of ways that you could um, get at that, um, and including all the, the targets that, that, that Peter was talking about earlier. But m much of that data tends to be over fairly short periods of time. Um, here's one possible um, source on which we might look at satisfaction with public services. That is complaints made to the Ombudsman, the Parliamentary Commissioner for Administration, um, on, uh, on alleged uh, maladministration. And what, what you see here um, is the, the blue line is the, the number of complaints that MPs uh, lodge with the, uh, with the Ombudsman. And at the, at the bottom, you see the lines of uh, complaints that got through the, the, the filtering process or were upheld. And what conclusions you're going to draw from this depends on whether you think the raw number of complaints um, is the really significant one. That doesn't look like a picture of increasing satisfaction. Um, or whether you think the, the filtered numbers are, are more uh, important. If we break down those numbers among uh, departments or departmental groups, as we have to do because the particular boundaries of departments, of course, have changed a lot over this period, what we see there is that it's the it's the social um, <coughs> security, employment and benefits bit of government that is almost solely responsible for that increase in lodged complaints. The, <coughs> the, the province of what is now the uh, Department of Work and Pensions. And it was the tripling of complaints about that bit of government that had driven that graph I just showed you up in the first half of the 1990s. In the case of health, uh, which we've been talking about a lot uh, today, um, you see uh, a similar kind of story. This is showing you what happened to complaints to the health uh, service ombudsman. I've had to cut all of these graphs off um, before the current day um, because reporting conventions changed in a way that it's difficult to uh, bring them right up to the uh, current period. Um, for why, if I go back here, why, why we see uh, complaints about taxation uh, rather falling in the uh, <coughs> ombudsman <coughs> data may be um, maybe because of the, of the creation of the tax adjudicator organization in the early 1990s. And this is showing you what happened in this case for accepted complaints uh, about uh, tax uh, <coughs> cases over that um, period. So from these complaint figures, um, the, the, it's hard to see evidence of increasing satisfaction. Um, the, the best complexion you could put on these numbers would be if you take the filtered numbers uh, rather than the raw numbers of complaints. A second um, area in which we could look at uh, dissatisfaction um, might be uh, cases that go to judicial review and you could argue that, um, <coughs> that, uh, that go litigating against government applying for judicial review is perhaps an even stronger indication of dissatisfaction than complaining to your MP uh, for, for an ombudsman uh, inquiry. And this is looking at what happened to the incidence of requests for permissions to, um, to apply for judicial re review in England and Wales um, over 1970 to 2010. And what we see here, as you can see from this red uh, area here, um, it's immigration appeals that, that drive most of that uh, increase, but even if you just look at the at the blue area, which is uh, which is um, a, a request with immigration cases taking up, you're still seeing a more than doubling of that incidence uh, over the 
Yeah, it's clear, but it's just a loose type of thing, but it's just strange. If we cross over the board, you can look at the same type of uh, different systems looking at Scotland and Northern Ireland, which have different procedures for uh, judicial uh, review. <coughs> um, we see a similar kind of pattern of uh, increase, in fact, proportionately greater increase uh, in Scotland than in England and Wales. <coughs> um, but again, if we want to if we want to look at the number of cases that are in which we get requests that requests are allowed rather than lodged, um, you see that over this period, um, the percentage of applications for judicial review that have been allowed, England and Wales in this case, um, have uh, markedly fallen. And as <coughs> with the complaints data that I was talking about earlier, um, if you put a big emphasis on this uh, defining uh, proportion of cases accepted uh, for review, um, then you might call, come to different conclusions than if you just looked at the number uh, of uh, cases <coughs> that are actually requested to be made. And the third item that I, I mentioned was um, the issue of legislative quality and preparation. And I'm extremely pleased that Christopher Foster from the uh, Better Government Initiative is here because I'm going to take his name in, in vain at this point um, and, uh, and quote um, from Christopher's uh, account of what he thinks is wrong with legislation. He says we seldom any longer produce good new laws. He contrasts the situation back in the 1960s and 1970s when he says practically complete, already well scrutinized bills entered Parliament because, he says, uh, there were extensive meetings, one between ministers and their civil servants, two between departments, three between uh, government and outside interests and experts. Since then, he says, um, we've seen uh, an increase, um, but an increase in the quantity of legislation, but a decline in quality, and here are some of the reasons why he thinks um, the quality uh, has declined, ministers being fewer concentrated attention, um, different departments of points of view not reconciled before bills get to parliament, so bills were poorly drafted and incomplete, etc. Um, and so he says that what we see is a plethora of late stage government amendments uh, to legislation. So these are strong claims, and the, the, the question um, that Ruth and I have been asking is, can we see evidence uh, for this if we look at um, a succession of pieces of, of legislation? And what we've been looking at is criminal justice laws, and you know, that's uh, a very important one uh, on that uh, in, in the room. And we've looked at 13 cases of criminal, uh, criminal justice uh, laws since the early 1970s, and they've they're shown here with different colours according to whether they were first introduced in the Commons or the Lords. And what you see there is first stage and second stage amendments uh, for those that succession uh, of, of laws. And I think I should say that I, I'm not aware, though I stand to be corrected, that this kind of analysis <coughs> has been done before. And uh, certainly Ruth and I know that it's very hard work and difficult to get um, the data, oddly. Um, what that uh, is suggesting is that uh, we, we did see in that later period um, quite a, 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 a number of cases with a large number of, of amendments, although it's interesting that after Christopher uh, published his book, maybe this is an example of your <laughs> influence, um, the, the amendments do seem to have uh, fallen back a little bit. Um, that's just looking at all the amendments together. However, one of the things that, that has happened, and I, I'm not quite sure why this is, is that the Criminal Justice Act uh, in this family of, 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 or this succession of laws do seem to have broadly grown in bulk over this period for reasons I don't uh, fully understand. It's difficult for anyone to explain that. Um, and so if we, if we look at amendments relative to the size of the Act, uh, rather than absolute numbers of, of amendments, we don't see such <coughs> clear evidence for what I'll call the, the, the Foster treatise. In other words, we don't see a clear um, 
differ right over time. So um, what we find is that there is some evidence for the phosphor feeding. If we look at absolute numbers of enzymes, they could be stopped in this situation. Um, but, uh, but, but when we look at it relative to the total size of bills, it doesn't, it doesn't quite so clear. This is very much unfinished work. We're, we're, we're embarking on another set um, of, of bills that we're, that we're looking at as well. But what I think it becomes really <coughs> thinking about the work better thesis. I think we have to record a Scottish verdict and not frozen verdict at this point, as, as, as po uh, Pollock and Herr Pinkert do. Um, on the basis of these data, and you'll see what I mean by claiming that these aren't rhetorical questions. I think it would be hard to argue from most of the data that, that I've shown you so far that we see signs of pure improvement, unless you want to argue that it's a good <coughs> thing to produce policy that leads to more legal challenge or leads to more late stage government amendments uh, in Parliament. But of course, uh, there's a lot of scope um, for what we should uh, count as down to a changing environment and what we, what we see as a changing performance. Let me turn now to the other part of the, of the story about um, cost less. And here I want to go through uh, what happened to running or administrating costs for central government, um, isolated in various ways what it costs to collect the taxes, always important in public administration, and what happened to the cost of pay bills. Um, now, <coughs> the, although it's often said that, 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 um, that, that efficiency is, is, a, is, a driving, uh, is, a, is a driving theme of public sector reforms, and certainly in the, the Lord economy in crisis, um, it's been noted, not least by Alistair Roberts and by Christopher uh, Pollock writing 15 years ago in both cases, that there was very little evidence um, for, uh, for cost reductions. And, and this um, evidence gap remains even up to the present day. I had to review a very big fat book on so-called new public management uh, with 700 pages or something. Um, last year, and that, 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 that showed remarkably few studies of the, uh, of the effects of uh, reforms across different countries on the costs of government. Now, uh, Ruth Dixon Rice um, has produced uh, this here, which uh, attempts to show you what happened to UK civil departments, especially UK cases of defence, which we couldn't understand however hard uh, we tried. Um, and what we have done here is to, it took us about a year to draw this uh, kind of simple graph. Um, and it shows that over the, the, the period shown here, um, that running costs of UK uh, civil departments uh, rose by nearly 40% in real terms um, over, over this period nearly 40% above what they'd been in the bad old days of in, uh, in uh, modern reform. One of the reasons why it took us so long is that the, that the basis on which, the, on which running costs are calculated are constantly uh, changed. Uh, and this, this shows you all the different runs of data that we had to look to um, to get to that graph. And what we had to do was work where we had overlapping data and then rebase it back to the, to the, to the, uh, to, to, to the original base. And that's what gave us um, this, this graph. I think we may have to thank Tony Travers in part for this because I think in the days when he was on the, um, uh, uh, the advice of Treasury Committee, he always insisted that the Treasury produced old numbers along with, um, with new numbers and that enabled us to do this. Uh, research, but there's one was one point at which Tony seems to be asleep on the job, <laughs> <laughs> and that's this part where we can't exactly match the old data uh, with the new. Um, so that's the that's how we got to those new numbers. 
across, over the period that um, I've been <coughs> talking about, uh, spending roughly doubled uh, in real terms of its spending. Um, and we should ask about relativity, the same question that we asked about complaints and amendments to legislation. And then if you look at what happens with those running costs I just showed you against uh, total managed expenditure, um, what we find is that running costs uh, fell by about 1% relative to total managed expenditure over that period. So the question before the court, is, and I'm very interested to know what you think about this, is, is a 1% fall in running costs relative to total managed expenditure at a time when total managed expenditure doubled, is that a good performance or not such a good performance? If, if, if much of the spending is about writing bigger checks to local authorities or to the NHS, etc., would we expect running costs to rise at the same rate as the number of noughts on those checks? Or how do we interpret these data? Um, one question that we might ask if we're dealing with, with complaints is, <coughs> were those running cost changes driven by uh, one department or set of departments? So what we've done here is to uh, divide those, th th those data up among uh, main departmental groups. And what we, we don't see here, that, that as, uh, as we did with the uh, DWP uh, field in terms of, of uh, ombudsman complaints, we don't see a single department as counting for the whole story. Uh, it is true that the Home Office um, exerted a, a, a very continuous upward pressure, but it's not just about the Home Office. This was happening in other departments as well. Um, so it's not just about one department story. And if we look, go over the border and we look at what happened uh, in Scotland, um, we, we see, um, we, we also see Scottish spending, which is also roughly doubled in real terms between 1980 and, and 2009. And we see a fall of just under 1% in the, in the running costs of the core Scottish department, the so-called uh, Scottish department over the 20 years from uh, 1990 to, to 2009. Um, so again, same question, is this a good performance um, or, or, or not? Let me turn to the, the second issue. What does it cost to uh, collect the taxes? In principle, this is an area where there could be a lot of scope for managerial changes. In principle, there could be a lot of scope for creative use of IT, as, as Helen was telling us about uh, earlier uh, on. And certainly, if you read through the reports of the tax departments over all these years, and believe it or not, Ruth and I have read every single one of them, um, they're full of promises and claims about the uh, advantages of such development. Um, so what this is showing us is what happened to the cost-yield ratio of uh, tax collection uh, in the UK, broken down between the, the two former tax departments, the Indian Revenue and the Customs and Excise, which came together to form HMRC in 2004, um, a, a merger, by the way, which was, uh, w which was advocated on the grounds that it would cause greater efficiencies in tax collection, which is because it has yet to be realized on these data. Um, but maybe it's too uh, early to say that. So what we see here um, is uh, a pattern in which we see uh, tax collection costs um, rising and then falling um, for both classes uh, of taxes uh, over this period. Um, and that's again, that's that's the conventional way which long before the new public management was used to measure the performance <coughs> of uh, the tax bureaucracy. If we look at the, at the absolute cost of, of tax collection, um, just what it costs to run the tax departments, what we find is a picture that's very similar to those that I showed you earlier uh, about the running costs of, of civil departments generally. It doesn't di di diverge markedly from that pattern. And of course, what happened over this period was that uh, UK tax revenues rose very sharply. 
um, uh, producers, and it's because of that pattern of tax growth that those relative uh, costs fell. So they didn't, the relative costs didn't fall because the absolute costs uh, have fallen. And if we look at uh, UK tax production costs uh, relative to other OECD countries, this comes from the, the last year's uh, government at a glance, um, uh, documented as showing three years of tax collection costs for 13 OECD countries. You see the UK um, well, roughly in the middle of the pack if you, if you allow for measurement uh, errors. Neither a star performance former like Sweden or at the other end of the, of the, co of the, uh, of the cost uh, scale. Um, this pattern that I've been showing you uh, concerns tax collection. Um, Patrick Dunleavy and, and uh, Leandra Carrera at the, at the LSE have, have also done work on the uh, productivity of, of tax collection. And th they've worked as well over longer period um, on social security uh, productivity um, from 1988 to, to 2008. Uh, and this uh, is their conclusion, this middle line, uh, of what happened to uh, total factor productivity uh, in that area. Where again, um, they, don't, um, <coughs> they don't see a picture of rising productivity in this area over time. Um, they see a rather up and down uh, pattern. So final aspect is cost. Um, what it costs to pay the civil service. Um, and this, uh, this is a graph that also um, took us a very long time to, to um, compile. Um, there's a huge detective story behind this, um, which you could tell you more about um, than I can. But what this graph is, is telling you, and this line um, simply showing you what, what, what happened to staff numbers in the civil service, and the top line, um, and you'll notice that they, it all it comes in different colours, that's because it represents different data series, um, we see we see what it costs or has cost um, to, uh, to hire the civil service or to pay more. And what has happened here again is that we have different data series um, that we have had to match up. We don't always have overlap. Um, so that's why we've colored them in different uh, colors. But we are reasonably sure that that top line going from green, from green to green to black um, is represents uh, reasonably comparable uh, numbers. And they would lead you to the not very dramatic conclusion um, that it costs about the same in real terms uh, to hire the civil service um, in 2010 as it had done 30 years or so earlier. And we find the, the same picture if you look at, at, at the, <coughs> although you can't do it over, over such a long uh, series, if we take the Scottish Department, um, we, we see something that looks rather similar. In the case of the Scottish Department, um, we find that, that uh, pay bills seem to roughly track staff numbers. The one uh, seems to follow the other in a reasonably intelligible way, um, but that does not apply um, to the UK numbers. There's something very peculiar uh, happening there, and this is a point that was raised indeed by the NAO a few years ago in a, in a, in a typical report on the management of pay bills in the civil service. So, if we go back to the issue of um, did it cost less across these items that I've been talking about, um, Ruth and I have worked out a, a scorecard um, in which which looks like this, and we're looking at those three items that I've just taken you through. Looked at three periods, so this, we could call them early uh, new management period, basically Thatcher government, the, the mid period, um, uh, major uh, Hitler, and then a, a later period. And what we've done here 
happen to those numbers over those three uh, different tiers and over the whole period. Um, and the red numbers are where they've gone in the opposite direction of um, costing less in a significant way. Um, the green numbers is where they have been, uh, where costs have gone down in a significant way. And the blue numbers are ones where um, you wouldn't want to put any weight on those numbers one way or the other because they're probably smaller than uh, any reasonable assumption of, or measurement error would lead you to. Um, so what we found actually is that the, the only period uh, in, 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 in all of this, this era uh, in which all of the indicators, all three that we've taken here, fell significantly, the only period came in the last four to five years of the John Major premiership, um, not one that's often cited as, as, uh, as, as, a, as, an, uh, as an era of uh, dramatic change, uh, where we saw all of those numbers uh, reducing uh, significantly. But even then, um, those uh, reductions yielded less than one third of the uh, running cost savings that are being called for by the current coalition government. They came closer um, to, the, to, to the savings that the, that the Scottish government uh, is aiming for over 20 years, over the same number of three years. So it's not been taken in UK. So let me come back, and I'm, uh, I'm coming to my conclusion here. Did Ford Wessels of the Corbyn Whitehall create a government uh, that works better and costs less? Well, from the numbers that I've been taking you through this evening, probably not, especially if you take that and with conjunction. In other words, both things uh, have to happen. Maybe not even if it's disjunctive. And, and particularly if we, if we put the weight on the absolute costs, the absolute numbers of complaints, um, we focus on trust in government rather than in, in, the, in the civil service, um, that, that would lead you to um, more negative conclusions. But you could ask whether that's a fair check. Um, how should we interpret these numbers? Um, some possible counter arguments that we could uh, consider and that might be more supportive of a works better, costs less interpretation of what I've been telling you about, would be that, first of all, those performance levels uh, in terms of, of administration costs or complaints levels would have been even worse if we hadn't done that reform. Uh, reform. That's a counterfactual. Um, always a, 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 a trusty standby. Um, and of course, it's hard to get uh, evidence about it. But if we look, for example, at what happened to civil service pay bills over time going back to the early 1960s um, before the days of, of, of modern managerialism. We can see that pay bill has been falling as a proportion of, of total uh, money's expenditure over uh, quite uh, some time. Um, and it's, it's not clear that, that, that modern managerialism has made um, much difference to that. Um, a second uh, possible counter-argument would be, well, rain's not built in a day. Uh, effects uh, take longer to arrive than you might think. Pain comes first uh, and then chaos later. Well, maybe, but we've looked, we've looked at 30, 40 years of data um, this, 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 after, this afternoon, or well, in preparing for this afternoon, um, and you, you might say that that's a, a reasonable test of, of whether uh, cost reductions uh, might be expected to, uh, to arrive or, or indicators of greater satisfaction. A more difficult uh, counter-argument that, that, that David Heard has, has put to them, which I think is very difficult to deal with, is that um, reforms may have, have had the effect of altering the distribution of uh, in a way that, that makes comparisons uh, over time highly problematic. Um, if, uh, for instance, um, the, uh, the, 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 the aim of, of, of managerial changes results in more, more, more being loaded onto what's 
sort of running costs in the post education and programme sector, um, then you have to look at those two elements. But this is very difficult uh, to do. And so uh, within our limited ability, we think most of these claims are either impossible to test or not wholly convincing. And then there's a, a, a final question about um, why is it <laughs> that the process of uh, administrative reform seems to systematically destroy the documentary basis for any evidence-based evaluation of performance over time. When you go to your doctor to get your blood pressure taken, you expect it to be taken uh, using the same kind of metric um, as happened the last time you were there. Um, and that's the only way, indeed, uh, that you can tell whether your uh, health condition is improving or otherwise. But if every time you go to your doctor, you find that the definition of blood pressure has altered and the, the equipment used to take it has altered in such a way that it's impossible to compare whatever the, the, the metric is now with what it used to be, um, then it's not, you can't know uh, whether your, your health condition is improving or not. And that's really the kind of problem that we've been facing and uh, continue to face um, looking at, at, these, at these kinds of, of data. Um, that's my uh, conclusion for this evening. Um, and I'll be interested to know what your research indeed, Christopher, that, that <coughs> is ab absolutely fascinating and, um, and particularly appropriate to welcome um, Richard Markson to reply. He's been the Assistant Secretary of several departments, including covering much of the data um, of study which is covered in that period. Richard. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I haven't got any uh, slides. Uh, can I get rid of this one? Because it yeah, says, yeah. And why does the process of administrative reform seem... Uh -huh. oh, we could leave it at that, please. It's a, it's a humiliating question. <laughs> When we were talking earlier, um, we got into the question of whether, there, whether, whether the civil service uh, and a career in the civil service should be thought of as a, a turkey race. Uh, there's a very interesting presentation by Alison Wolfe about a military career. Um, but um, uh, at the time, I sort of th thought this rather carefully, and I thought, well, I was still alive. I was in the civil service for nearly 40 years. I was doing OK. Perhaps uh, along the way, I got stuck. But, but now I realize. <laughs> I'm actually in the oven, and I can I can smell uh, the burning. Now, uh, let's um, let's just say something autobiographical, because this is very helpful to my uh, to my cause. I think. Uh, not only was I the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Defence and involved in defence for a very long time, so I can deal with why there are no defence members, uh, but also that would be a very good example of how I think government works better. We used to say in defence, this was another good year for defence. The nuclear war didn't break out. I mean, the philosophers amongst you might think there's a logical fallacy in there somewhere, but it all served us well. I was also, in the early 1990s, the permanent secretary of the Office of Public Service Enhancement, responsible for public service reform uh, under John Major. And therefore, I regard in some ways uh, what uh, Christopher has done as, uh, as a, a further example to add to my magnum of your CV. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, on the other hand, it might not be. Now, let, let's, just, um, let's just think uh, about some of the points that were raised. And I was, asked, I was asked to respond in between five and seven minutes. And I knew that uh, Christopher was going to cover three or four decades. So I was really basically given two minutes uh, or one and a half minutes per decade. So I've got to be very, very quick. But let's focus first on the points about uh, how the government works better. Now, I don't want to dispute the statistics that were put up. Uh, but actually, I think uh, if you ask the average punter, whether it's a politician, or average punter or politician, politician, man in the street, etc., how does the government work better? I'll come back to this uh, briefly later. Uh, what they would have in mind is, has the whole process of government, including the work of Whitehall, changed their lives in positive ways? Um, and um, I always used to end this particular uh, version of my remarks by pointing out just how more economically successful we are now 
worked and in the good old days of the 1970s, I had to delete that now. But, but nevertheless, that's what they would be thinking of. They would be saying, is my hospital better? Is my school better? Is uh, the citizenship better or worse? Am I safer? These are the questions they would really be asking. And those uh, statistics that uh, Christopher put up, I hate to call it his, but Catherine's is, is uh, so distinguished and I'm certainly in admiration of it. Those statistics that you put up, they are actually rather poor uh, performance indicators in terms of what anyone would think about the answer to the question, how did uh, government work best? They, they're valid, actually, and I'll come back to some of them uh, if I've uh, got time. So um, what I then wanted to dwell on was, uh, if we turn to the other side of the uh, equation about cost and so on, one or two aspects of the very important and interesting figures that, the, uh, that Christopher put up. And obviously I can't go through them in the, in the detail that, uh, that he, he did. But I just wanted to pick out five interesting facts, four of which uh, he put up and one of which I'm going to add. Uh, the first was that I think he said that uh, total managed expenditure, TMA, over this period roughly doubled. Uh, 96%, I think, was the number. Um, uh, so that's all of the expenditure on uh, uh, all public services uh, and various other things like debt insurance um, and so on. We have the expert in the room in Nick McPherson. In the same period, I don't suggest there's much significance in this, but in the same period, other than a political one I'm going to come to, civil service staff costs fell by 1%. In the same period, well, they meant grow. They grew by 1%. 1%, well, I, I, you know, I'm a civil servant. Grew by 1%, fell by 1%, oh, it's the detail. <laughs> civil service numbers during this period fell by 30%. Okay? Just keep that in your mind. Now, what is interesting is, however, how I mean, is if you start to get into disaggregation, because one of the problems I think we have with a high level of analysis of this kind, for reasons that are obvious, you can't disaggregate. So I just want to disaggregate one aspect of this which is in terms of civil service numbers, because I think it's, both, uh, it's a very interesting disaggregation for all sorts of reasons. In 1981, there were 695,000 civil servants, full-time equivalent. 462,000 of them were in civil departments. 233,000 of them worked in defense for the Royal Ordnance Service. Just keep those numbers in your head. In 2009, there were 490,000 civil servants. 414,000 of them worked in civil departments. 76,000 of them worked in defense. So actually what we've had over this period is a massive reduction. I'd like to point out I was a quarter of planner for defense for most of this period. A massive reduction in defense and in defense numbers, including civil service numbers, which have fundamentally helped fund growth elsewhere. I'm going to argue against this as a matter of policy. 68% of civil service reductions were in defense civil service. 10% were in civil departments. So if you just thought about the dynamics of that, and then you also said to yourself, so what is the experience of the civil departments of actually cutting? Not very much, really. Uh, where is all the expertise in cutting? Uh, it's in uh, one department, uh, defense. Now, what story do these big numbers tell us? Uh, put in a slightly wider perspective. I just wanted to touch on uh, five aspects of this. Uh, well, four aspects of this. L something around language, something around focus, something around expectation, and something around competence. Right? Now, th the, point I the reason why I want to mention language is because this might come back to a much broader set of issues where Christopher's made a number of uh, very valuable uh, contributions over the years. What is interesting about one of the things he's trying to show is has the new public management really had much of an effect in the way Whitehall works, in the way it improves efficiency? I'd ask a slightly related question. How many people who were operating inside government at the time over the very long period knew that what they were doing was the new public management? <laughs> and moreover, what they actually thought they were doing was they were riffing in relation to three different things. They were riffing in relation to ideas about economy, ideas about uh, effectiveness, ideas about efficiency. That's what they were doing. A very small number of them might have realized we're actually doing this thing called new public management, insofar as they did, a number of the people in the game would have hated it. So for instance, Nigel Lawson, he was a big economy man. He didn't want to hear about efficiency and effectiveness. He just wanted loads of economists. 
And then we get to John Major, and uh, he probably didn't also realize that he was engaged in new public management. But what is interesting is he was the most successful person in doing it, and he was the one most held up to ridicule for what he tried to do. So, for example, I, you, many people in the room aren't old enough to remember this. I was responsible for the citizen scarf. Wonderful idea. I didn't find it too easy to mention it in polite circles. So you have a political paradox, which is the person that focused most on a coherent policy in relation to all of these things, including efficiency, is the one, as Christopher said, who got the least praise. Well, I'll come back to that in a minute. If you think about focus, <coughs> and you start with politicians, the political focus of politicians is not on many of these issues. The political focus of politicians is on health, education, law and order, defence, where defence is thought of as military. Uh, what they're interested in is growth in public expenditure and can they develop a story that suggests that this is improved soon. They see the civil service as really something not much to be talked about, if it can be avoided being talked about, and the way to avoid it being talked about and therefore to take the focus off white boys was to appeal to civil service members best. And that those are not almost an immaterial part of the whole system. So in a way, when we think about, is this about, did government work better? We're focusing on the thing that, for most politicians, became not material because the civil service spent the need to think about and make this semi-flippant thing, unusually for me, uh, got the civil service into a position where it was not politically salient in relation to all these other things. And I think we do have to focus uh, on political uh, salience. So how far do ministers care, for example, about productivity in comparison with their other goals? Because if they really cared about it, then probably we'd see the system we're focused on. Well, I could give you many stories about this. Uh, when I was, I was the permanent secretary of the Department of Work and Pensions, a wonderful organization uh, on ministerial staff. Uh, and we had a number of goals, and one of them, which was given down to us by our alternative Secretary of State, Gordon Brown, who we have here constantly in what we did, uh, was to reduce our goals. In parallel with that, he laid down in detail the timetable for how we would introduce new initiatives. So, for example, I was responsible for introducing a new initiative on pension and training. If I had said to him, the way in which he wishes to do this, and the timeline in which he wishes to do it, is fundamentally grossly inefficient unproductive and I'm not going to do it. I really would have been a turkey. The point was that what he was interested in was can I do this thing within a framework that looked roughly okay in terms of productivity. So my political goals weren't really about efficiency, they're about something a lot broader. Now, who's selling the point? Expectations are I think a very interesting question. What would good look like? Now, all the numbers here, the two comparisons, are actually based on the GDP deflator, because that's exactly the right number to use, the right method to use. It's an interesting question. If civil service uh, take-off rise marginally over this period by 1%, while civil service numbers fall by, say, 30%, is that a good or a bad result when you're using the GDP deflator as the measure? Now, I don't think it's self-evident that the answer is it's not a good result because uh, all the economists in the room would point out that there's a relative price effect in relation to certain goods and services which we use to anything like those supplied by government. So it might be a good result. So the interesting question would be, do the numbers tell us that the outcomes were good or bad? Now, I've said something, finally, I've said something about uh, ministers, and I might have implied to you, and I sometimes do this and get picked up on it, that really all the problems in government lie at the, you know, at, at, uh, the hands of ministers. Uh, and this is absolutely not the case. So why is there this charge sheet capable of being made? Now, I think it's for a range of reasons, and for a number of these reasons, the people who are responsible are obviously officials, which I was one, and other public servants with whom uh, we work reasonably closely. Now, what might be some of the contributing factors here? The first one, which is absolutely a fundamental contribution of both ministers and officials, is government is much too complex. And the way in which uh, programs are initiated and policies are defined and details settled is beyond the capacity of the people who are then entrusted <coughs> to deliver to deliver. So if you want to know why there are all these complaints about social security and so on and so forth, look at the social security regulations ask yourself 
anyone to do. Imagine that the people who are employed to do this job could implement this rubric. I couldn't understand half of it, and I'm a reasonably intelligent uh, person. So there's a fundamental issue about complexity which we need to address, and that is a joint responsibility in favor of military and officials. And then I think officials have to take a lot of blame for some of the problems that we can see here. They have to take the blame for a weakness in thinking about how you turn policy into delivery, including what it means to delegate. Uh, a lot of new project managers have ideas about delegation. I don't think most of the officials do focus on turning that into something we understood what delegation meant. There were massive weaknesses in target setting uh, and inconsistencies in measurement, as Chris has already pointed out, over time. Why did these exist? Answer, because everybody games the system. There are fundamental weaknesses in project uh, delivery in government. The most fundamental weakness is there is no systematic approach to benefit realisation. I don't mean benefit here in the social security sense. So projects are developed, they have all the associated paraphernalia, we're talking about the fee discussion. By the time you get to benefits realization, almost everyone who was involved has long since gone and there's no deep seat at all. And so that fundamentally, I mean I exaggerate, you know, I do tend to exaggerate a little bit. That brings us therefore back to the fundamental weakness, which I think is the one that, um, that uh, Alison Wolf touched on earlier. There are big, big issues around continuity in government and institutional and memory. And that's the area <coughs> that we need to tackle. Almost all the public sector organizations that are contributing to making government work better are in very interesting ways, as Chris has already commented on, which I think are interesting ways, driven by a variety of motivations. And some of those motivations are not in the interest of the organization one of those motivations that not, is not in the interest of the people in government is the capacity of people to move around the system and not take responsibility for the things that they have devised, promised benefits for, failed to realize, etc. So that needs to be a fundamental part, uh, I think, of our agenda. Now, I will, I will stop uh, at, at that point um, uh, because I think we want to move over to a few questions and then uh, I have deliberately not spent my time paying tribute uh, to Chris there. That is not to imply that if I was given another five minutes, I'd only ever run a third of this, but I wouldn't. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. That, 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 that is, is always stimulating and raises a whole range of questions. Now, we've got about um, 10 minutes for points to be raised and questions. Could you say who you are, please? Um, there are, there's a mic, um, Kerry's got there. Um, gentleman there at the end of the row. Thank you. My name is Patrick King from Objective Corporation, and we advise government in policy management. Um, in the light of Margaret Hodges' recent uh, campaign announcement yesterday to uh, suggest that civil servants should actually be accountable to Parliament rather than to ministers, I wonder what your reaction might be to that in the light of your thoughts and also Chris's views. Have you already said it? Uh, yes, if you listen to the week in Westminster <coughs> tomorrow, uh, BBC, I don't know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock, you'll hear a discussion between me and Margaret Hodge, which, if it hasn't been edited out, will, I think, through the discussion from various sources and so forth, establish that the idea of officials being accountable to Parliament is nonsense. <laughs> Right at the back, right at the back. Uh, wait, for, if you wait for the mic, please. Chris uh, University College London. Um, uh, first of Chris, I, I think you've done a fantastic job of collecting this data. I've collected some times here with data by the Royal Institute, and you just know how difficult it is. And all this, you know, each, each one of those bits over here is, is like ten times different. So uh, that's a fantastic achievement. And secondly, um, I do agree that fundamental question which you raised at the end, which is a brain um, thing, it is a bit of a worm, is that it's really difficult to separate out um, what would have happened anyway uh, in, the, in the absence of the public sector reform, which is so in some ways the data isn't able to be uh, really a complete picture of the situation as a whole. But perhaps you've been perhaps over 
take that as a friendly question. I mean, you're, saying that we, you're saying we've done the first bit. <laughs> right, what's at the back? Yeah. Mr. Burrow, I um, also wanted to add to the congratulations on the Center. Um, I spent quite a lot of time in the National Archives and realized that actually there's almost nothing that's comparable even within the National Archives. Um, <coughs> two questions. One problem I always have with those My immediate question is, what was so wrong with people in the 1950s? Um, <laughs> and I, I wonder, are there other survey questions that you could use that would pull apart the effects of social decadence, which might well have exaggerated what people thought was crushed, but was actually something else, from what might well be in later periods of people understanding the question in much more instrumental and transactional Conversely, those satisfaction issues. I mean, I, I wonder, um, the problem with satisfaction as a concept is that it's always experienced as something by expectation. And I wonder, are there ways in which using other survey data, or indeed using um, other forms of administrative data, you might be able to develop some proxies for the expectation denominator? as well as just presenting us the numerator of, of the uh, reported experience. I, I fully understand the, the, the point about <coughs> um, the, the problems about using these, these, these cross statistics. I mean, Christoph Pollock has written about this with, with, with Giet and what do we mean by these numbers, the late Mary, uh, Mary Douglas was all about this as well. We both knew her. And Anora and Neil have, have said similar kinds of things. Um, the, the the fact that the, the problem is um, that we have for the earlier period, if you want to look over a whole 30, 40 years, um, we've got fairly crude data over the whole uh, the whole period. Uh, I, I'm sure there's more available than what I showed you, but I did try to to show you that you come to slightly different conclusions according to what data source you use. But who knows what people think when they're, when they're asked, not just about trust, but the civil service. What do, what do they think of as the civil service? Are they thinking of Sir Humphrey and Whitehall? Or are they thinking of the, the people in, in the social security? Yeah. We have no idea. Maybe yeah. they mean local government people. Yeah. Well, you know, we really don't know that. Yeah, but, but just to make a very quick point, uh, obviously I don't have much to do with that. The, um, there's also an issue, I think, around what, insofar as what Christopher was raising is very interesting issues around cost effectiveness. I think that's you know the fundamental question is not have some for instance in relation to services have some of these things not improved I think they definitely some of them have improved uh, it's whether they've improved in ways which are justified by the huge cost and my answer to that is generally speaking is fairly negative I think but when you ask the public those questions which they don't really I think wrap them in they don't wrap the notion of cost effectiveness into their answer because it'd be very difficult to do so so in a way it's quite difficult to get at one of the very interesting issues raised by this, which is, have these in, a, improved, but if they have improved, have they improved commensurate with the huge increase in the cost? Yeah, can I just say, from my own experience, of having done a lot of work on, on this, and also 
and how society and circumstances come to life. People don't have a clear idea which, uh, what has to distinguish the civil service. And when you ask about trust in government, they also want to even mention the governing party. Mm. And actually, if you disaggregated your data on trust, the peak for all the round general elections, mm -hmm. if it goes up, because people have higher expectations of a change of party and then this will be protected. Mm -hmm. Now, I, there's three people who had their hands up. If they can, I'm probably not at the back, two there, just to, if you can make one sentence point, no longer than one sentence, and <coughs> I, 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 I don't mean this kind of deal, but it's only a sentence, quick sentence, please. Save me the trouble of talking. Yes. Um, I'll cut you off if they're too long. Okay, you've made your point. Behind you, gentlemen behind you. Yes, um, related to uh, the interest parties, yeah. Um, I think I've heard the phrase somewhere, the politics matters. Um, and if, if one looks at uh, the King's Fund, um, the, fa the history of funding the NHS, Thank you. And over there, just one last question for Oscar. Well, I'm glad that David Faulkner uh, defended me in a way. It certainly, I didn't rely on uh, uh, criminal justice theory for my argument. Neither do I find uh, reliance on other means. Because not only have you got the problem of tracking them down and systematically looking at them, but it's not just the amendment that, um, that actually uh, amends them, it's also a mass of other amendments which we know actually go through. And virtually all the information I read, every piece of hard paper in Parliament said that the quality of legislation had declined greatly uh, in the previous 20 years or so. Now thank I you. So I rest my case. Yeah, you, thank you. Um, I just invite finally, um, before Christopher says some final words, Richard, uh, Christopher, to comment on those three points that have been made. Well, I, um, as a member of the Better Government Initiative, So there might be a small issue, you know, just any case. Chris, would you want to comment, comment on, on, on those three points? Just to, in, in relation to the criminal justice uh, issue David Faulkner raised, <coughs> um, we took that area, as you know, because we did a special review, um, because we thought we could trace a series of bills over time in the same kind of policy area, and it would give us an I idea as to whether we could identify trends over time. Um, we would be the first to accept, and this is also a point for Christopher Foster, um, that criminal justice isn't the only policy field, and we need to look at others. But it is very labor intensive to do this work, so, so um, we won't be able to do very much more. But we are planning to, um, to look at some some different generations of, of NHS reorganization legislation, which we think would be another possible uh, test of the, of the Foster thesis. Um, and I, 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 I quite take the point about the, the ambiguity of, 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 of satisfaction numbers. And uh, we, we were going on the, on the kind of naive view that you don't complain if you're satisfied, and you don't go to law if you're satisfied, and that's why we took those indicators rather than, than further data on satisfaction. Thank you on that. Actually, I just kind of give a nice and plug. We are going to be producing a report in the summer on the health bill. Um, Nick Timmins, um, who's doing it jointly with the King's Fund and us, will be doing an analysis. 
and it's the process of that legislation which uh, makes my life interesting as well. Could I, b before Christopher wind winds up, say thank you, uh, thank Christopher, and thank all of you here, and all, all the speakers on behalf of the IFU for, for participating today in, a, in what's been an uh, excellent conference. I've been here for part of it. Um, but the last session has been um, for, for Friday evening at this time. Uh, has raised levels of liveliness that uh, we didn't see anywhere else in London. <laughs> and <laughs> before Christopher says his thank yous, um, we will have some debates and so on outside. I asked Peter if I could have a couple of minutes at the end <coughs> because I want to say on my own behalf um, that I want to thank everyone who's come here today on this occasion at their own expense, sometimes over uh, awesome distances. We have pe people here from Japan, from Brazil, from very far afield. They've given up scarce time and a great deal of money to come here. I'm tremendously flattered and pleased by that. Um, I'm also grateful to all the speakers uh, today and all the chairs for their contributions. I'm glad to have been the excuse for those interesting discussions. I, I've, I've, I refrained from intervening but because I thought I would have my chance uh, later on, but, but they, they all provoked me to think about um, how the various fields that they were talking about um, had developed. I'm very grateful to the Institute uh, for Government for hosting and paying for this event in these uh, magnificent um, premises. And I want to thank as well everyone who's contributed to this uh, exploration to in government, a governance uh, booklet. Five organizations have uh, funded its production, including, I'm glad to say, my own department. <laughs> um, and um, especially to um, Martin Lodge and uh, Ruth Dixon, who commissioned and edited it. It really is a, a work of art, and I know uh, how much effort must have gone into doing that. I'm really grateful for that. And I think most of all, I'm grateful to the instigators and organizers of today's uh, event. Um, <coughs> Martin Lodge, Oliver James, Helen Margetts, um, Peter Thomas, uh, uh, Kerry Burkett, uh, um, who handled the registration, and to Catherine Haddon, who unfortunately can't be here today. But most of all, I think to Ruth Dixon, who I think was the chief conspirator in this event, and I wanted to express my very sincere uh, thanks to her. Thank you.